Okay, I'm going to go into the lecture notes section. Okay, and if we scroll down to the very bottom set of notes, um, in this chapter 10 uh, section, I want to click on um, this summation set of notes. And I also want to click on this section 10.1 set of notes. All right, so I'm actually going to start with the sequences summation set of notes. All right, so this is mainly a review from College Algebra. And we're just going to review what a sequence is. And a sequence is a function that has a natural set of numbers as its domain. Now, when we talk about um, the classification of numbers, um, one of the classification of numbers are whole numbers, right, which are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Next, we have what are called natural numbers. Natural numbers are also called counting numbers. For example, if I wanted to count the number of people attending class today, I would start with the number one. All right? And then we have integers, which are the positive and negative whole numbers, and so on and so forth. Right? But a sequence is just a function that has the set of natural numbers. So notice that the natural numbers start with one to infinity as its domain. Now, the f of x notation is not used for sequences. We write out f of n as a sub n. Sequences are written as ordered lists. We would have the first number in our list is a sub 1. The second number in the list is a sub 2. The third number in the list is a sub 3, so on and so forth. Notice that we have a sub 1, which means that the natural numbers, its domain actually starts from 1 to infinity. a sub 1 is the first element, a sub 2 is the second one, so on and so forth. All right. Now, in this example, you're simply asked to write out the first four terms in a sequence. And I'm actually just going to pull up a calculator to just kind of quickly show this. So here we have a sequence formula, right? It's written in sequence form as a sub n is equal to n plus 1 divided by n plus 2. And we're asked to write out the first four terms in the sequence. So if we were to write out a sub 1, which would be the first term in the sequence, I would simply substitute 1 for n in our function or in our formula. So let me clear this out. So I'm going to put a set of parentheses, 1 plus 1 divided by, I'm going to open up a begin set of parentheses for the denominator, right, 1 plus 2. And I'm sorry, that should be 1 plus 1. Right, because n is 1, and then we have 1 plus 2. Okay, I can convert this to a fraction, and we have 2 thirds. Right, you can find a sub 2, a sub 3, and a sub 4 in a similar fashion. Now, we have what is called a finite sequence and an infinite sequence. Basically, in a finite sequence, you can count all of the numbers in that sequence. 
right? So here I see that this sequence has 10 numbers, right? I can physically count 10 numbers. However, an infinite sequence has an infinite set of numbers. In this case, it's denoted by the three dots. Okay, the three dots, that's called an ellipsis, and that refers to the fact that this list never stops. It simply keeps going. Now we have two types of sequences and series. We have what's called an arithmetic sequence and we also have what's called a geometric sequence. The questions in this course only deal with the arithmetic sequence. Okay. Now in the other, the textbook we were using uh, last semester, it dealt with both the arithmetic sequence and its geometric sequence. I'll talk about the geometric sequence, okay, but you won't actually see any questions related to a geometric sequence. So what is an arithmetic se uh, sequence? An arithmetic sequence is a sequence in which each term is obtained by adding or subtracting a fixed number to the previous term. For example, 5, 9, 13, 17 is, a, is an example of a sequence since 4 is added to each term to get the next term. The fixed number is called a common difference. So I'm going to talk about this common difference. Here's what a common difference is. Okay, so I have my sequence of four numbers. In order to find the common difference, I would take the number after. So in this case, I want to take 9. I would subtract it from the number in front, so I have 9 minus 5, and I have a difference of 4. This difference must be the same for every set of numbers in a sequence. So if I take the next set of numbers, 13 minus 19, excuse me, 13 minus 9, I get 4. And if I take the next set of numbers, 17 minus 13, notice that my common difference is 4. That would classify this as an arithmetic sequence. So let's say I try to apply the same thing to, the, to this sequence. I want to see if I have a common difference. Well, 2 minus 1 is 1. 4 minus 2 is 2. So notice I don't have a common difference, which means that this is not an arithmetic sequence. All right. So if you are dealing with an arithmetic sequence, here is the formula that follows. In an arithmetic sequence, the first term, a sub 1, and a common difference, d, and the nth term, a sub n, is given by this formula. a sub n is equal to a sub 1 plus n, the quantity n minus 1 times d, where a sub 1 is the first number in your sequence, and d is your common difference. All right, so let's take a look at this formula. Okay, so here is that list, that sequence of numbers that we were just looking at, 5, 9, 13, and 17. And let's say we're asked to write the formula for the arithmetic sequence. Okay. And you'll see how writing out the formula for an arithmetic sequence is similar to 
the formula. So first off, I'm given the fact that it's an arithmetic sequence, right? So we're going to write out this formula. So I'm going to write it out as a sub n. Now, I want to keep in mind a couple things. I want to keep in mind the first number in my sequence and also the common difference. So notice the first number in this sequence is 5. And if I look at my pattern of numbers, it seems like this pattern increases by 4, right? 4 plus, excuse me, 5 plus 4 is 9. 9 plus 4 is 13. 13 plus 4 is 17, right? That's that common difference of 4. So when I write out my formula, a sub n is going to equal to 5, right, plus my common difference, which is 4, times n minus 1. Right, so now when you write out your formula, you always want to make sure that you would get the numbers that are in your sequence. So here again, first off, this is an arithmetic sequence, right? So I'm writing this out as a sub n that's equal to 5, which is the first number of my sequence, which is where this sequence must start, which means I have to include 5, plus... And notice that the number after my first number increases by 4. So to account for the other numbers in your sequence, we have n minus 1. Right? So if we were to just check out our formula to find a sub 1, I would go back to my a sub n formula and I would substitute in a 1. So I have 5 plus 4 times n, which is 1, minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 4 times 0 is 0. 0 plus 5 is 5. So I get the first number in my sequence. For a sub 2, I would use my a sub n formula, and I would substitute n for 2. So we have 5 plus... 4 times n, which is 2, minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. 4 times 1 is 4. 5 plus 4 is 9. All right. So notice I do have the numbers in our sequence. All right. So this is the formula. So notice that here's the formula for an arithmetic sequence. And notice how it relates to our formula. So remember that general form was a sub n is equal to a sub 1. Right? So a sub 1 is the first number in your sequence. Okay, now the formula was written a little bit different on that slide. Right? Plus, and then it had n minus 1 times the common difference, right, which is 4, all right, so here is the general formula and how it relates to the formula for our list, all right, so that should be your steps to find the formula for an arithmetic sequence. Find the first number, find the difference, and use those basically in the formula. You would simply substitute in your first number. You would substitute in your difference, and that should give you the formula for your list. All right, next we'll talk about geometric sequences slightly. And a geometric sequence is obtained by what's called a 
common ratio where you simply multiply each, multiply the preceding number by this common ratio. All right, so what is a common ratio? We found out a common difference was when we subtracted the number after by the number before. A common ratio happens when you divide the number after by the number before. So for example, what is the common ratio in this sequence? Well, I would take the number after divided by the number four, the number before. So two divided by one is two. Four divided by two is two. 8 divided by 4 is 2, 16 divided by 8 is 2. So notice we have a common ratio. So that constitutes this as a geometric sequence. So now your sequence, it has to be one or the other or neither. can't be both. So if we were to find a common ratio here, Right, 9 divided by 5 is 9 fifths, 13 divided by 9 is 13 ninths, so notice there is no common ratio, therefore this is not a geometric sequence. Now here's the formula. Okay, I'm just kind of scrolling through here. So the formula to find the nth term of a geometric sequence is given by a sub n is equal to a sub 1. So remember that a sub 1 is the first number in your list times r, which is the common ratio raised to the n minus 1 power. Okay. All right, so the same thing was done here. It says, well, in this one, you're asked to find a sub 5. for this given sequence, right? So a sub one is one. The common ratio here is negative three, right? Because negative 12 divided by four is negative three. 36 divided by negative 12 is negative three. Negative 108 divided by 36 is negative 3. So here again, once we have our first term, which is 4, we have our common ratio, which is negative 3. We can write out the formula for the sequence, right, by using a sub n is equal to a sub 1 times r raised to the n minus 1 power. So a sub 1 is 1. r is negative 3 raised to the n minus 1 power. Now one thing about this formula, you cannot multiply 4 and negative 3. You must leave this formula in this form. All right, so that's the difference between a arithmetic sequence and a geometric sequence. Now we talked about this conversion, convergence and divergence concept earlier. Um, a convergent series, it basically has a limit, right? It gets closer and closer to some value. A divergent sequence has no limit. Okay, the next slide just kind of show we don't really deal with recursion formulas. This is actually college algebra type um, PowerPoint. All right, so here I just want to review arithmetic sequence and geometric sequence. 
Okay, next I'm actually going to pull up the section 10.1, right? And this set of notes actually comes from a calculus textbook. Okay, so the materials are going to be explained a little bit differently than in the algebra setting. Okay, so we talked we talked about this earlier. Sequence is just a list of numbers and they're written out as a sub 1 through a sub n. Um, the first term in your sequence is a sub 1. Um, the last term is a sub n. All right, now on this slide, here are some um, picture representations of functions that converge or either diverge. All right, so notice on this first function, a sub n is equal to the square root of n. I'm actually going to pull up the calculator and graph these as well. Now, when you determine if a function converges or diverges, there's a couple of ways you can do these. You can do these by using a calculator. You can also do them analytically by using some limit formulas. So first, we're going to take a look at um, just looking at the graph, and then we'll take a look at some analytical methods. So if I were to graph the square root of n, I'm going to go on to y equals. I'm going to clear out any function that I have. I'm going to put in the square root of x. I'm going to hit zoom 6. All right, so what are we looking for? Well, a sequence that converges would have a limit. Right, a limiting value is the number as n gets either bigger and bigger and bigger, or it could get smaller and, well, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, does it come to a certain value or does it rise or fall? So if we look at the square root of n, Notice that as we take a look at this graph as n approaches infinity or as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what is our y value doing? Well, notice that this graph, it doesn't converge to a y value. This graph will actually keep rising and never actually stop. If I go into table, I'm going to hit second and table. And I'm just going to look at the values. As x or as n in our formula gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm just going to hold down the down arrow. So just notice what's happening to the numbers as n or x gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The y value is also getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Since it's not converging or approaching a certain value, the square root of n is diverging. Let's look at the second sequence. a sub n is equal to 1 over n. So again, I am going to go into y equals. I'm going to clear out my y sub 1. I'm going to put in a function 1 divided by x and I'm going to graph. So let's take a look at this function as n gets larger and larger and larger. So notice by physically looking at the graph, notice that the y value gets closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. If I go into the table, 
right? And if I just kind of pump down on the N or the X value as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what's happening to the Y value? Notice that the Y value is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and approaching zero. So this is a convergent series. All right, and we'll take a look at the last formula. It's negative 1 raised to the power n plus 1 times 1 over n. So I'm going to go into y equals. I'm going to put this in as negative 1. And I will use a set of parentheses raised to the x plus 1 power times 1 divided by x. And we're going to graph. And why is my graph not showing up? Negative 1 raised to the x plus 1 times 1 over x. Okay, I'm going to try something a little bit different to graph. Okay, I kind of see why this is not graphing. Notice when you graph this, you're not actually getting a graph per se. So let me kind of explain what I did. First thing, I use zoom 6. And what this does is it puts it in a negative 10 to positive 10 increments of 1 for both x and y. And then I hit zoom fit. I was trying to fit the graph to the screen. Right? Notice I still didn't see anything. Now I'm going to go into table for a second. I'm going to hit second and graph, which is table. And let's actually see what's happening to our sequence. All right, so notice I've, I've, I'm not at, actually at zero. But notice what's happening as X or N gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Notice that it's not actually converging to a point like this one. Like this kind of converged to zero. What this graph is doing, and it's, it's kind of oscillating around zero, and it seems like, I'm going to keep going down, it gets closer and closer to zero, right? But it's kind of alternating. This is also a convergent sequence. This also converges to zero. For the simple fact that even though it doesn't actually converge, it goes, it oscillates around a central limiting value, which is zero. And on top of oscillating, it gets closer and closer and closer to zero. So this is also a convergent series. Okay, now as far as the analytic parts, um, here it just says uh, a convergent and diverging a, a converging and diverging function. Here is just the formula for that. The sequence a sub n converges to the number l if every positive and this is epsilon, there corresponds an integer n such that for all n, this is lowercase n is greater than capital N. That implies that the absolute value from a sub n minus L, remember L is that limited value, is less than epsilon. So if you think back to the calculus one course when you were finding the precise definition of a limit, this is basically what we have here, or a portion of it. 
If no such limit exists, we say that the sequence diverges. All right, so what does that mean mathematically? Well, mathematically, in order to find if a sequence converges or divergence, you would simply take the limit for that sequence as n goes to infinity. So on this slide, here are just the rules that you have seen in Calculus 1 for limits. Right, the sum rule says you can basically distribute your limit. Right, so I'm giving some conditions here. It says the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n is, is equal to capital A. The limit as n approaches infinity for b sub n is equal to capital B. If you're finding the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n plus b sub n, you can distribute your limit and simplify. So the limit of n, the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n is capital A plus the limit as n approaches infinity for b sub n is capital B. All right, so we can distribute the limit. You can also distribute the limit through a difference. For the product rule, here again, you can take the limit of every factor in your product. For the constant multiple rule, you can pull your constant in front of your limit operator. And in order to find the limit of a quotient, you can take the limit of the numerator and the limit as n approaches infinity for the denominator. All right, so we will take a look at some examples. All right, so here are some examples. Find the limit. A sub n is equal to 2n minus 7 over 7n plus 1. All right, and there are a couple of ways to do this problem, and we'll take a look at both those ways. I just want to show the differences on these two. In order to find the limit for this sequence, what I must do, I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity for both sides. So the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n, that's equal to the limit as n approaches infinity for 2n minus 7 over 7n plus 1. All right, so from the rules we just had taken a look at, I'm trying to find the limit of a quotient so I can find the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom. But I want to point out something for a second. If I were to take the limit 
for 2n minus 7. I'm going to graph that for a second. And I want you to actually see the graph. I'm going to see if it converges or diverges. So I'm going to put in y equals. I'm going to clear out my functions. I'm going to put in 2x minus 7. And I'm going to hit zoom 6. So notice that this graph does not converge. It diverges, right, because it's in gets bigger and bigger and bigger, my y value is increasing. If we take a look at the denominator, 7n plus 1, notice the same thing happens. All right, so here's an algebra trick for this problem. So in algebra, what I could do is I could divide the numerator, every term in the numerator and every term in the denominator by the largest power. So what I mean by that is my, I'm, when I say the largest power, I mean the largest power of my variable. So if I look in the numerator, I have one term that contains a variable n, it's raised to the first power. If I look in the denominator, I have a term that's raised to the, I, I have a term that has a variable n that's also raised to the first power. So the greatest variable power here is n to the first power. So I'm going to divide everything by n. So that's 2n over n minus 7 over n, 7n over n plus 1 over n. And now I'm going to take the limit for the numerator, the limit for the denominator. So I'm going to distribute that limit. And I'm also going to reduce. So the limit as n approaches infinity for 2 right, minus the limit as n approaches infinity for 7 over n divided by the limit as n approaches infinity for 7. So keep in mind, I have reduced plus the limit as n approaches infinity for 1 over n. So keep in mind now, this is an algebra method. All right, so now if I take a look at my limits, I'm just going to try to keep this on the same page. The limit as n approaches infinity for 2, it should be 2. And we'll verify these in a second. Minus the limit as n approaches infinity for 7 over n. Well, if n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and if I'm, my numerator stays the same, my limit here should be 0. And we'll graph that in a second to physically see that that limit should be zero. The limit as n approaches infinity for 7 is 7 minus the limit as n approaches infinity for 1 over n is 0. So the limit here is 2 sevenths.
All right, so I'm just going to verify the limits for these using the calculator. So if I go into y equals, and let's say I'm going to put in 2. And if I graph, I'm going to use zoom seven, zoom 6. Notice that the limit is 2, right? Because as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, notice that the y value converges to 2. I'm going to replace that by 1 over x, and if I graph, notice that the limit as n approaches infinity for 1 over x or 1 over n, or that could also be 7 over x or 7 over n, they are both 0. And then the limit as n approaches infinity for 7 is 7. Therefore, we have the limit as 2 sevens. Okay. All right, so this is one way, and this was a college algebra type solution. Now, here's a more calculus solution. So I'm going to take the same problem, and I'm going to use La Hospital's rule. I'm not quite sure if you're actually familiar with this, but what La Hospital rule tells us is that if we are finding the limit of a quotient or a fraction, okay, which we're doing in this problem, We're taking the limit of a fraction. The numerator diverges. The denominator diverges. Okay, they both go to infinity. So we're going to use La Hospital's rule. So what La Hospital rule tells us is that we are going to take the derivative of the numerator. We're going to take the derivative of the denominator. And then we're going to find the limit as n approaches infinity. So this is what we have. Okay, I'm going to take the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub n. So that's going to equal to the limit as n approaches infinity. And I'm going to take the derivative. The derivative for 2n minus 7 should be 2. So the derivative of my numerator is 2. The derivative of my denominator should be 7, right? The derivative of 7n plus 1 with respect to n is 7. You can apply La Hospital's rule more than once if needed. So let's just say if we had a function that had cubes, we could take La Hospital rule. And then if we weren't able to derive a limit, we could apply La Hospital rules again. We can keep taking the derivative as many times as needed in order to find our limit. All right, so here I don't have to use it again. Notice that I'm given a constant 2 sevens. So the limit as n approaches infinity for 2 sevens should be 
two sevens. All right, so we found pretty much the same solution without without using so much algebra. All right, now here is the, I guess this will be the last problem for the day. We want to find the limit The limit uh, cosine n, that should be n, divided by 5 raised to the power of n. All right, so we would, we would do some of the same things. I would, I'm dealing with a fraction. So I'm going to look at the numerator. I'm going to look at the denominator. Well, if you look at the cosine of n, the cosine of n doesn't actually converge. It keeps oscillating between negative 1 and positive 1. And then if we look at a denominator, 5n, notice that for 5n, if you were to graph 5n, that would also diverge. So La Hospital's rule could be an option. But there's one thing about La Hospital's rule. When you take the derivative for a cosine, you get sine, which also oscillates between negative 1 and 1. So in these instances, what must we do? Well, in these instances, the best thing to do is graph or use some type technology. So I'm going to pull up the calculator. And I'm going to graph that. So I'm going to go to y equals And I'm going to put in the cosine of x divided by 5 raised to the power of x. Since I'm dealing with a trig function, I'm going to go into mode, and I'm going to just make sure that I'm in radian mode. And I am going to graph. So notice if we're going to take a look at the graph as n approaches infinity, notice as n approaches infinity, there is a limiting value which should be 0. So I'm going to go into the table to actually verify that. Okay, I'm going to start this table back at zero. I'm going to go into format. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to go into table set. So that's second and um, to get to table set, I'm going to start this table at one, at, excuse me, at zero. And this delta table means that it is going in increments of 1. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is where it's going to start. And now if I go into the table, all right, and as n or x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, notice that the y value is approaching 0. Now, one thing I want to explain about this, the notations you see here in this calculator, for example, this 
negative 1 e to the negative 25. I just want to make sure that you understand actually how to read this. So I'm going to go back to our All right, so for this example, the limit as n approaches infinity for a sub being should equal to zero. And here we just used the calculator. Okay, and you're going to find on some problems you have to use some type technology. All right, now as far as reading that little notation, for example, negative 1 e to the negative 25, okay, just to make sure everyone understands what they're seeing here, this e is actually shorthand for times 10, and this is my power to the negative 25 power. Right, so here's what that means. I have negative 1, and I'm going to write it over here. So, And if I were to write negative 1 as a decimal, I have negative 1.0. Here I have a number that's in not quite scientific notation because this, is this isn't positive, but... If I were to write this in standard form, this 10 to the negative 25 power, which would mean that I would have to move my decimal point 25 places to the left. So notice that is a really, 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 really small value, close to zero, but not actually zero. So you would move this thing out 25 places, which means you would have 24 zeros in front of this one. Right, so that's an extremely small number. Right, you'd have tw 24 zeros. Okay. All right, and the number would still be negative. All right, so sorry about how that looks, but I wanted you to know how to decipher this notation that you see. All right, so with that being said, um, that kind of wraps it up for today um, as far as arithmetic and geometric sequences are concerned. When we meet again on Thursday, we'll take a look at Taylor and McLaurin series. Um, there's nothing in particularly that's too particularly difficult. We basically have a formula, and we basically take our function, we find derivatives, we evaluate those derivatives at some number, and then we just kind of substitute those things back into the formula. All right, so when we meet again on Thursday, okay, we'll take a look at the last section. The final exam should open up Friday until Wednesday. Okay, there's no set time. You can take the exam at 12 o'clock noon or you can take it 12 o'clock midnight. Um, that the exam will be open. Um, the requirements on what you can use and what you can't use, those things are on the announcements page. And there should be a final exam review by the end of class on Thursday. All right, so there are they. I'm going to stop the recording at this time.